Autolite and its 96,000 dealers bring you the brilliant young motion picture star, Mr. Richard Basehart, in tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story of a man who found it necessary to commit the perfect crime. A tale we call The Perfectionist, starring Mr. Richard Basehart. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hey, Harlow, why the cheers? For the team, Hap. What team, Harlow? Why, the team under your car's hood. The Autolite electrical system, the family team of precision-made units, including the generator, battery, coil, distributor, starting motor, and all the other important parts of the complete Autolite electrical system used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. Does this team play full-time, Harlow? It works full-time, Hap. Every time you press the starting switch... Every second your engine is running, and whenever you use your horn, lights, or radio. That auto light electrical system is a real winner, eh, Hilo? You bet, Hap. With all units related by auto light engineering design and manufacturing skill to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. So, friends, when your auto light equipped car needs replacement parts, take a tip from me and insist on auto light original factory parts. And remember, from bumper to tail light. You're always right with Autolite. And now, with The Perfectionist and the performance of Mr. Richard Basehart, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. There. It's all written. I couldn't confess it verbally to these police. They're stupid men. Men who discovered nothing about the murder through their own efforts. It was a mishap, a blunder, which revealed me. I know. I killed him. When it comes to murder, few know it as I do. Few could have planned as I planned. Few could have put the body in such a trunk as I designed. A perfect trunk for transporting the body. Perfect. I'm a perfectionist. And that is my failing. I have been, in my perfection, destroyed by imperfect men. The man I killed, he was old. Old enough to be my father. I had planned each step and shipped his body in the trunk to a city only 90 miles away from the scene of the murder. Only 90 miles. And it was the fourth remaining step of a calculation in which each move had the precision of a mathematical equation. Your check, please. Here you are. It's a medium-sized trunk. Now, we go by the numbers. It was train 91 out of Carlton. We arrived 30 minutes late at 7.21 a.m. precisely. <laughs> you should have been a train man. You're better than the dispatchers. Gee, uh, I'm sorry, mister, but I think we sent your trunk out by mistake. You... what? Oh, we'll get it back. It happens sometimes. You idiot. You stupid idiot. Oh, wait a second. I don't have to... Take... Yes, yes. You're quite right. And I apologize. When was it delivered? Yesterday. Has, uh, has anyone phoned about it? Has anyone called? Complaining of the error? No. Perhaps they don't realize they have the wrong trunk. Perhaps they haven't opened it yet. Do you think that's possible? Do you think they might not have called because the trunk is still closed? It's the only reason people really beef when they get the wrong trunk. <laughs> they scream like wounded eagles. Well, give me their name and address. Oh, I'll look it up in the book. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, here, here it is. Name's Granick. Yes, thank you. Whoa. Ain't you going to write it down? I don't have to write it down. Oh, well, see you. Clerk, let me see that trunk. What? I want to see the trunk. I, I want to be sure it's not mine. The claim check's wrong. Yes, and perhaps that's where the mistake lies, in the claim check. Okay, okay. So much nonsense about a lousy trunk. Yeah, it's right here. Come on in here and look. Look. 
Yes. This is my trunk. You sure? You have skeleton keys. Open it. Ah, if it's your trunk, you got a key. I, I lost my key. Uh, here's, uh, here's ten dollars. Open it. Okay. That is my trunk. The drafting equipment, surveying instruments, uh, they're mine. The tags must have been mixed up. If you want proof, why haven't they phoned? This is my trunk. This one, not the other one. I hated that clerk. I hate anyone I have to depend on. And I had to depend on him. I had to ask him to help me when I know you can never trust anyone's help, ever. But I had to discover who the other people were, and their trunk would tell me. I had to know their secret before they found out mine. Take their trunk, not to exchange it with mine. They might doubt me, ask me to open it. No, I had to get my trunk my own way and dispose of the body before anyone missed the man I had killed. Their name was Granick, and some letters in their trunk told me he had been a cripple for three years, paralyzed from the waist down. An accident, a fall. I knew more than that, much more. I knew he'd just come out of a rehabilitation hospital. But did I know enough to get my trunk without their knowing who I really was or knowing the trunk was gone? They would know nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing of me, but I would know about them. Doesn't it give you a sense of power to know someone else's secret without their knowing any of yours? Yes. How do you do? Mrs. Granick? Yes. My name is Christensen. Is your husband around? My husband is in the living room. I know. You're going to say he can't come to the door. I know of his accident. What did you say your name was? Christensen. Chris. I know your husband has a great problem. He must. Anyone handicapped like that must have. You have no right to say anything like that. No, no, uh... Uh, didn't they call you from the office? Didn't they tell you I was coming here? Who is it, Betty? It's just If someone... they didn't call you, then you must listen to me. It's to your benefit to listen before I see him. Betty! In a minute, dear. See, we're a non-profit organization devoted solely to evaluating the attitudes of the cripple. How they're functioning. How much help they need. How dependent they are on others. On their loved ones. Uh, you know what I mean, Mrs. Granick? Surely you must know how terribly dependent such victims become with an inability to help themselves. The refusal... Uh, or rather, a refusal to see what they're doing to the lives of their loved ones. Isn't that so, Mrs. Granick? Do you... Do you want me to tell him who you are? You can tell him I'm from the hospital. A routine interview checkup. A follow-through checkup. Come in, Mr. Christensen. Two hours have been lost. But once more, I began to feel better. Control of the whole situation was coming back into my hands. Once more, I knew I could succeed. I could get the trunk and dispose of the body, as I'd planned to do it, not as circumstance dictated. And because I had control again, I was able to listen to this wasting hulk of a man, this William Granick, as he regaled me with his memories. But the trunk... Where was the trunk? I suppose everyone goes through this. Maybe I've taken longer to recuperate. Why is that? It's because of your active life, Mr. Granick. Your previous activity was outdoors. Always. Civil engineering isn't for sissies. Oh, no, it's, it's for men, for real men. Building bridges and roads, that's for doers. You were a doer. Was a doer. Was. Bastards. And will be again. Never again. You had a hobby? Yeah, when I worked at the hospital. Dull and stupid. He still has his drafting equipment. We kept that. Yes, yes, that would be good. Work hypothetical engineering problems. I used to do that. I was going to be an engineer. For amusement, I used to pose hypothetical problems for myself and work them out. Really? Where'd you study? Oh, back east, a long time ago. It couldn't be too long. <laughs> it's very long. But you're a young man. You, about your civil engineering. The drafting equipment, 
surveying instrument. I lost interest. Can't do anything with it. I can't sit indoors and pretend it's outdoors. Well, where is the equipment? Around. You know very well where it is, Bill. We put it in storage back home where we used to live. We took it out of storage, Mr. Christensen, and had it shipped here. Is it in a packing crate? No. Well, then what? What, what is it in? Well, what difference does it make? In case I could help to get it for you. A woman alone can't do it. Such equipment is heavy. She isn't alone. I'm here. Yes, darling, yes, you are. You are here and you do help me. It's in a trunk, an old trunk. And uh, where is this old trunk? In the closet, but I don't want to see it. I had a man who delivered it, put it there in the closet. I'm through with it. And you haven't opened the trunk? You haven't opened it for uh, a long time? In a way, that's better. It's raining. What? It started to rain. Are you a... Uh... Maybe it's presumptuous, but not many people come over these days, but... Uh... Are you busy for supper? Why, no. No, I'm not. I'd be delighted. I was exhilarated. The excitement of getting my trunk. The thrill of my long battle almost won. Almost over. Ah, it's important to be exact. Only the exact survive. I felt... As if I could do anything that night. Anything I wanted to. All the skills I'd developed over the years. Waiting. Waiting for them to go to bed. Waiting to get to the trunk. I used one of those skills. I made a pencil drawing of the man. All right, turn your head. A bit this way. I guess. There. There, that's it. Uh. No, it's not right. We'll start over. It's about the tenth time. I'm going to do this in oils, ultimately. It must be right. Exactly right. Yeah, maybe in engineering. You have to be that accurate or a bridge would collapse if we went off a fraction. But in this? In Europe, uh, uh, I studied in Europe. I was told I had a great talent, a truly great talent. Correggio. You ever heard of him? He's a great teacher. He told me I'd never make a living at it because I was too demanding of myself. That's not good. Be too demanding. Expect too much of yourself. That's it's wrong. It's gone. Once you decide to abandon a talent, never turn back. My husband is going to turn back. Of course, that's different. I mean, an artist, when he doesn't feel greatness in one field, should go on to another. And an engineer? I'm sure you were a fine engineer. Yeah. I was one of the best. He's won awards. Uh Mr. Christensen, would would you like to see him? I, uh, why, yes. They're in the trunk, honey. I'll show you. No. Please, don't bother yourself now. We'll have, uh, we'll have lots of time to talk. Lots of other conversations. Many. Many. Yeah, I, I guess it would be kind of boasting. Oh, it wouldn't be. There's nothing wrong with being proud of what you've done. No, no, no. Never mind, Betty. <sighs> Oh, excuse me. It's awfully late. You know, Mr. Christensen, you, you've been kind of good for me. Brandon. How's that? Oh, uh, Brandon. Brandon Christensen is my first name. Oh. I'm glad I've helped you. But how? Well, by showing me that we shouldn't hold on to something we can no longer do. But you can, darling. You can. No, I'm a cripple. I can't. And what would you propose as a solution? And maybe I ought to start with those drafting instruments. Start? How? Maybe sell them. Maybe get them out of the trunk tomorrow morning and sell them. Yeah. Well, I better get to bed. Good night, Mr. Christensen. See him out, Betty. I can manage the crutches. Would you, uh, would you mind if I finished filling in my report here? No, certainly not. Go right ahead. Thank you. I'll uh, see myself to the door, Mrs. Gunnick. Well, good night, Mr. Christensen. Yes. Good night. Now, wait. Wait for them to sleep.
Autolite is bringing you Mr. Richard Basehart in The Perfectionist. In tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. What are you doing? I'm showing you how the Autolite electrical system in your Autolite-equipped car provides the power for starting the engine, sounding the horn, and playing the radio. And the lights and heater, too, eh, Harlow? Right, Hap, as well as the power that's so important every second your engine is running. They're all powered by the Autolite electrical system, in which every unit and component part are related by Autolite engineering design and manufacturing skill to give you the finest performance money can buy. The electrical system is mighty important to us car owners, Harlow. And that's why you should treat your car's electrical system to a periodic checkup at your authorized Autolite service station or the dealer who services your make of car. You can quickly locate your nearest authorized Autolite service station in the classified section of the phone directory. Or call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. She'll quickly tell you the name of your nearest authorized Autolite service station. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Richard Basehart in Elliot Lewis's production of The Perfectionist, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I waited until the house was silent, motionless, staring, listening. There, in the open closet, in the trunk, was the body. My heart started to pound. I advanced toward it in the dark. I felt wonderful. Here, so near completion. Here, in the dark. In a moment, I would have it open. In a moment. She! She came into the room and turned on the light. I slammed the lock back and whirled to face her. What do you want, Mr. Christensen? Uh, I... I only wanted to... I, you had the key to that trunk, didn't you? I... I wanted to tell you something. Yes? Don't... Don't press me. Don't demand. I'll wait. Well? It's... It isn't easy. It isn't easy. It's very difficult to admit an error. A lie, not an error. No, no, no not a lie. Uh, yes, it's uh, a lie. You're not from the hospital. You were never near the hospital my husband was in. How did you know? How did you find out about us? Who are you? Well, can you forgive me? Listen, don't judge before you listen. What's your name? And don't come any closer. I have this poker. I won't be threatened. I won't. I mean you no harm. My real name is Brandon, Carl Brandon. I mean you no harm at all. Please believe me. Please. Please. Why did you come here? I'm... I'm a student. Yes, I, I was in the army and wounded. I had wonderful dreams and plans about what I'd do after I got out. Wonderful dreams. My father's a rich man. He's old and rich. But I couldn't take anything from him after the war. And a pension isn't enough. But I couldn't take anything from him anymore. He gave me money and he told me what to do all the time. Why did you come here? I obtained a part-time job in the hospital to support myself. I did work there, you see. But in their storage room. And I, I heard about the trunk your husband had. With his and... drafting equipment in it? Yes, yes. The, the valuable equipment. I knew I could steal it and sell the things. I, I knew they were valuable. I know about things like that. I... I can tell you the cost of each instrument. Didn't the fact that my husband and I couldn't afford to buy new ones affect you any? Yes, yes, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, I, I admitted everything. Why do you keep accusing me? I admitted everything and I ask your forgiveness. Yes, I was wrong. What more can I do? What more do you want me to do? To leave. Turn to my father and say that I was wrong. I made a mistake. That he was right. Give me money. 
Tell me what to do. Order my life. Live my life. Show me my failings. Show me where I'm, I'm not as strong as he, as, as bright as he, as, as, as strong as... as strong. No, wait. Don't leave. What? Stay a while. Just a minute. Uh, sit down, Mr. Brenner. Go on. That's it. <sighs> the Mr. Brandon sounds wrong. Mind if I call you Carl, isn't it? Yes, Carl. Carl Brandon. It's a nice sounding name. Uh, Betty, make some coffee, will you, honey? Coffee? Yeah. How do you like it, Carl? Just plain black coffee. Uh, the way they drink it in the army, huh? The army? Oh, yes, yes, always. I was in myself. I know what it's like to come out and be hit with civilian life. This isn't a problem. There's nothing one cannot work out if one has the willpower and the self-discipline. No, I couldn't have. Not without Betty. Takes a woman or a friend or just somebody who cares. It takes someone to help. I don't need any help, Mr. Grunick. Bill. Just call me Bill. Mr. Grenick, I don't need any help. I'm fully capable of solving my own problems without help, without advice. We all need help sometimes. None of us can live without it. You're bitter. I, I can understand it. I, I've felt it. But you have to listen to other people sometimes. Now, why don't you try your homey little platitudes on yourself? Did they do you any good in that wheelchair? Have they made you bounding with hope and ambition? Are you a better person now than you were before you were paralyzed? Don't preach to me. You'd better leave right now. Now. No, 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 Betty. You have to listen. Maybe he's right, too. Maybe he can see my problem clearly the way I can see his. I... I can't stand waiting. Waiting sometimes makes me angry. I'm sorry. Sure. Sure, I understand. And even though I'm not too much older than you, Carl, I, I've seen an awful lot. I've been around a lot. And that's why, even though we might not meet again, I, I'd like to talk to you straight, like a member of your own family would. I don't need instruction. It's advice. And I don't need advice. Well, we all need it sometimes, Carl. His advice was just like yours, to do things the way he did them. But letting me know that I could never do the things the way he did them. That I was incompetent and he was better. Always better. I don't mean that. Not that way. Well, I did something better. Braver. Something more daring. More skilled than he'd ever dreamed of doing. Do you understand? I've accomplished what he could never do. What do you mean? What are you trying to say? That you can keep your rotten advice to yourself. That you're nothing but a cripple. You're the cripple. Not my husband. You're the cripple in your head. Only his legs are gone, but... All right, Carl. What is it that you've done that's so great? Get up. Go ahead of me. I'll show you. Do as I say now. Right now. I knew then. I knew I'd have to kill them. And perhaps they knew. A woman with a cripple for a husband. Perhaps they knew they had to be killed because... Because... I don't know why. I knew then, but I can't remember now. I knew more and more as they went fearfully toward the closet, afraid to make a move to attack me, afraid because he was a cripple and she was powerless. And I opened the closet door. My excitement was so great, I, I hardly remember each step. I'm not lying, I barely remember. I turned the key in the lock. Each move was precise, not a motion wasted, not one action misplaced. For this was my victory against everything that stood in my way. Not to argue, not to discuss, but to kill. To kill perfectly, quickly. Kill what stands in my way. Kill the Granics. Kill the man in the trunk. The man who looked like my father. And I swung it wide. <coughs> it will do no good. It will not help. The time is past. Why not me first, Carl? You afraid of me? 
afraid of a cripple? Why didn't I think? Why didn't I calculate? Why, for the first time in my life, an act of passion, without thinking, I leaped at him, like an animal, like a beast. <laughs> Have you ever fought a man whose legs are useless? Have you ever felt the arm of a man who uses his arms to sit and go and move and rise? They're steel. And they went to my throat, and I struggled in a dream. I can even feel them now. This wasn't the way. Where was my triumph? My victory? Where was my glory? Are you afraid of me? Please. Please. You're afraid of a cripple? Perfect man? Stop. Please. Stop. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Bill? I call the police first, Betty. Then come back and help me up. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Richard Basehart. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. That's why, during the early months of 52, the Autolite family will join together in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family is made up of the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast. Our family also includes more than 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as 96,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our Autolite family will salute the Dodge Division of Chrysler Corporation on the next Autolite Suspense television program. Check the day and time of suspense on television so that you will be sure to see this program. And be with us next week for another thrilling suspense program on radio. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Joseph Cotton, who will portray a man without emotion, the mechanical man in a tale we call Carnival. In weeks to come, we shall also present Mr. J. Carroll Nash, Mr. James Mason, and Miss Barbara Stanwyck, all on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Perfectionist was written for Suspense by Arthur Ross. In tonight's cast, Charlotte Lawrence was Betty Granick, William Conrad was Bill Granick, and Joseph Kearns was the attendant. Tonight's appearance is made possible through permission of 20th Century Fox. Mr. Basehart may currently be seen in their production of Decision Before Dawn. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Joseph Cotton in Carnival. This is the CBS Radio Network.